Good morning, everybody. Thank you to um, Steve for uh, inviting me down here today to speak about a topic that I've been involved in for quite some time. Um, what do I know about biometrics? I was part of the team at Delarue um, Identity to get part biometrics into passports about 15, 16 years ago. So um, part of the working group to get, um, and you may have experienced or had a poor experience in coming into um, um, the UK in the automated systems not, not actually working. But here we go. So, <clears throat> so now I'm the chief analyst and CEO of uh, Good Intelligence. We're a, a London-based analyst firm. We publish analyst reports, we do consulting, um, and we work with a lot of the um, owners of the biometric market at the moment. So we um, do advice strategy, um, go to market support for sensor manufacturers, um, fingerprint um, sensor manufacturers, iris, facial, most of the modalities involved in authentication identity at the moment, we, we, have, we, have, a, we have a role in. We also work with the handset manufacturers in terms of um, analyzing modalities, and a modality is a biometric technology, so fingerprint is a modality, facial is, is a modality, iris is a modality, um, in choosing or doing analysis of appropriate biometric um, technologies and modalities that are going into their devices. We also work with the authentication providers, identity platform people, companies like RSA who are now kind of integrating um, biometric technology into their authentication platforms. So, so that's us. So the, so the outline for the speech this morning, um, talk about high-level overview of why biometrics now, why biometrics probably in the last four or five years, and also some of the problems that we see with, with, with passports. Passports? Passwords. And a kind of an overview of how biometric te technology is being used, the type of applications it's being used in, uh, where we're getting kind of you know, high levels of growth and adoption, and also looking at the de different devices, uh, industries that biometrics is getting integrated into, including mobile, Internet of Things, smart cards, other devices, and also the role of, of cloud and uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence in, 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 in you know, improving the performance of, of biometric technology. Looking at some of the barriers surrounding it, and then the summary. So really, the, the, the key thing about biometric technology being integrated into, onto mobile phones or being adopted by financial service providers is convenience. And really, and one of the problems, when, we, when I first started Good Intelligence back in 2009, you know, the mobile phone, the smartphone, was just be beginning to be become popular, increase of data services, increase of over-the-top services, and using traditional forms of authentication and identity in a mobile phone is, is difficult. So, you know, if you're using a, a password, um, you know, if you're forced to do a long alphanumeric password, forced to change that quite often, it's difficult to enter that into, in, into a small touchscreen. And obviously touchscreens have improved with predictive text analysis, uh, but it's still very, very difficult um, to do that. So biometrics um, has a, um, a user experience improvement, and it's convenient. And now I, I've just moved from, from uh, one phone to another, and um, my bank now supports the, um, the Android fingerprint technology on that device. And I can see from my own experience, it's much easier just to use my finger um, to open the account, approve transactions, instead of having to um, use you know, a long password, or, or to use some of the more traditional, strong two-factor authentication solutions, hardware tokens, smart cars, etc. So convenience really is um, one of the major drivers for um, the um, adoption of biometrics. Not just biometrics, but kind of passwordless systems. So um, we've done a little bit of work with the FIDO Alliance, and the FIDO Alliance is a, um, uh, a uh, an alliance of groups, including Microsoft, Google, Amazon recently joined the board, to improve or to remove passwords and to improve the, 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 the authentication experience. And a kind of an anecdote from one of the founders of, um, 
uh, the Fido Alliance, which was PayPal, was that they, they had problems. So PayPal, I think, it, it's, especially in the early days, you may have used it, one, average user were using it once or twice per year. So, and that was probably, you know, your, your kid's birthday or an anniversary or something, so to, to buy something perhaps on eBay. So, the problem they found is that when you set up the account, you were forced to set up a, a, a long password, um, you know, using um, a variety of characters, and then you may have written it down or you may have memorized it, and then the time it came for you to reuse that password, perhaps a year after originally you, you set it up, you actually forgot that password. So you had to go through the whole account recovery thing. And because PayPal is just one option in a, an e-commerce site, people were abandoning it. People were thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to use it, I'm going to whip out my credit card and use that instead. So they were getting high levels of cart abandonment. So they thought, let's, let's try and solve the problem. Let's make it easier for people in e-commerce to, to authenticate, to verify their identity. And that's the kind of one of the stories around the foundation of the FIDO Alliance, which is one of the enablers for um, the use of biometrics, in, especially in the consumer world, for authentication. So, um, also um, emerging um, technologies, emerging ways in which we can interact with the internet or digital services. Now, really, smartphones are at their peak at the moment. If you look with um, iPhone 10, um, it was relatively poorly received. It's a thousand dollar phone. And people are getting a bit kind of, um, not fed up, but they're, they're not, the, the churn in, in people renewing smartphones is starting to peak off. So really we're at kind of peak, um, we're probably looking at about 1.2 billion devices being sold annually still, but the actual rate for people to change their phone is starting to slow down because it's a limit what we can do with a smartphone in terms of new and innovative technology. So the tech companies are looking at other ways in which they can make money and which, how we can interact with digital services. So Amazon Echo, voice space, speaker, pretty limited in what it can do. You've had cases of children kind of um, ordering stuff off, off it from, from, you know, on their parents' account. We've had, you know, so voice recognition and the voice authentication aspects of that could be important. Another area, Internet of Things, connected car. Um, we did some research just before Christmas in autonom autonomous vehicle security and um, authentication in, in, the in the vehicle. And car manufacturers are looking to roll out identity solutions in car that monitors. So this is the, fac this is the facial recognition using a, a, a small camera um, located in the, um, the mirror to identify that person. And there's also a picture that... So, so to the, what I'm saying is the password is not particularly good in those environments. And increasingly, we're going to move away from smartphone use, and we're going to be out, it's more kind of conversational commerce, um, interacting with more things, smart cities, cars, etc. So, what's wrong with passwords? I think we, we're probably, you know, pretty familiar, I'm talking to an educated audience here, in terms of the issues surrounding data breaches, mega breaches, uh, the figure there from um, the Verizon data breach report from last year, 80% of hacking-related breaches are the result of weak or stolen passwords. You know, huge depository of credentials, user information, stored centrally is a honeypot for hackers. People, as the case with Equifax, Verizon, Home Depot, Target, etc., goes on and on. You know, I'm not taking care of, the, of these, these passwords. And it's difficult to secure. You know, I, I've, you know I've, been, I've had security manager roles. I was head of security at T-Mobile for a while. I've worked in financial services. It's difficult to, to secure, you know, you, you know, this very, very sensitive, you know, pieces of information. So, there's one issue. Also, again, we're using more services. We're use, and we're reusing the same password. So, they're difficult to remember. We've got to write them down. You might have a book. Who uses a, a security um, password manager, an application or a service? Half. Half? Half? Yes. Half, half of what? I use it for half my needs. Okay. What, the less, less secure passwords? Yes. Okay. All right. No, I don't use them. I'm a little bit, um, 
paranoid, I think, for, for probably working in the industry too long. I just think they're a honeypot. I'm sure they're very secure, but I just got this feeling that it's just if it's if you if they go, then everything goes. So, but that's the problem with passwords. You know, you've got to have you know credential stuffing where p stolen passwords are used time and time again in, in multiple accounts to try and attempt to get into your account and do an account takeover. It, it, it's very, very common. So, passwords, you know, inconvenient, not very good in, in today's um, connected, multiple device environment. So, where are we using biometrics at the moment? And um, predominantly for authentication and identification. And I'm not talking the um, border control or the creepy surveillance aspects of, 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 of facial recognition or, or, or voice recognition. Um, although, I used to work for a company on the voice recognition side, and they were the company that, that um, 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 found Pablo Escobar using his cell phone. So they were the voice recognition company that was analysing um, voice prints on the wire and were active in, in, in finding Mr. Escobar. So there is that to it. But with, on the phone, obviously there's a lot of um, adoption of a mobile phone. Who, who uses biometrics on their phone? Touch ID, Android. Good. Good experience? No. No? Oh dear. Why not? Fingerprint technology is all hacked. It's very erratic in behavior. Erratic? Yeah. You've got sweaty hands? You wash your hands. Yeah. The fingerprint changes. If you've got grease on it, you get it on the button. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think it's old hat. It's old hat. Face better? Face better. Here we go. And identification. This one is an interesting one. It's to um, to solve. And this is a driving license thing. And, and we're we're moving identity onto um, and digital onto mobile. Um, a number of states in the US use it in conjunction with the paper um, or the plastic card. Um, but identification is very important. Is to verify identity. If we're opening up a new account, then companies out there are using um, um, trusted identity. So you scan your pass passport picture or you, you, you read the chip off the, the biometric passport and then you suck off the data and then you can do a match with, with your face. So that's good. You know, onboarding is, a, is an expensive thing for most banks and you've got a, with anti-money laundering and know your customer regulation, you've got to comply with these things and you've got to get it right otherwise you get fined. So this is where the kind of the two main areas um, that we're seeing um, biometrics. I just love that image. Um, so, and also for fraud management, so mainly um, voice recognition and behavioral biometrics. So instead of something you are, which is a, you know, a physical characteristic of you, it's a behavioral stuff, stuff we do, you know, how we type, how we use the mouse, how we interact with uh, a smartphone. So, um, and that's used for fraud management and fraud detection. And voice recognition, um, which is a passive authentication mechanism, will be used in, 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 in that fraud management. So I'm on the phone to my bank. This was interesting. There was, there was an article, I think, in The Guardian at the weekend um, about someone who had his, his credentials stolen and, and then it was the, the voice identity the, 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 because someone was then trying to replay those, those credentials on the telephone contact center. They knew it wasn't the person because they had a, 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 uh, the voice print of the authorised user and then they, were, they went to the step up authentication, step up verification and it stopped that fraud. So it's linked into fraud management um, systems and it's being used a lot by um, um, financial services companies. And then the emerging, this is the hybrid applications where because it costs money for a, uh, a mobile um, OEM, the manufacturer, to integrate, um, so it costs biometric technology, it costs Apple about $20 for the, all the components for, for Face ID. They want to get a um, you know, return on investment in that integration, so we can do other stuff with biometrics. And we're seeing it with things. So this one here, of the brain, and the little squiggly lines, is a brainwave and an EEG sensor is actually integrated and this works integrated into the into the headset of a car and it's 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 measuring um wellness so it's measuring if if the drowsiness and things like that so linked to autonomous cars um 
the, on what level you are. So if you're kind of falling asleep at the wheel or something and they detect that, or if you're going into some form of um, crazy brain state, then the car can actually take over. So that's the kind of a, a wellness thing. And it, it, it's, it's coming, believe me. Right, so, so we look at mobile, and this is going into, drawing down into those, um, uh, those different technologies. Um, you know, Apple was a, a game changer, even though it may not be, it, it is a low cost capacitive sensor. It does have problems with sweaty fingers and, 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 and people with, with, with uh, um, you know, not great fingerprints. Um, it, but it, it does a pretty decent job. And Apple have seen, you know, pre touch ID, less than 50% of people were locking their phones. Now on, on, on touch ID enabled phones, it, it's a much higher rate. I think probably about 80% now, even, even higher. So people are locking their phones, which is, which is a good thing from you know, very basic security. You know, billions of mobile devi of, uh, devices out there have form of capacity. Every mobile phone can support biometrics, really. It's just, the, just whether the, the service provider wants to turn it on. And also the use of the biometric APIs, Touch ID API, which supports Face, Android, native Android, um, and they're available to third party. So you can get a, a simple, you know, yes, no, is this the person we think we've got a you know, relatively good um, assurance that it is the person who owns the phone is going to be unlocking the device. A lot of banks, um, a lot of service providers supporting it. And, you know, this year we're predicting, you know, over another billion smart mobile devices will ship with biometric hardware integrated into there. And it's also not just the biometric hardware, it's the, 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 the environment that, that these sensors are working in. So you will have secure hardware, you know, a, a, you know, a hardware security model, a module embedded in the phone. You would have, you know, links into trusted execution environments. So with things like Trustonic, um, we know that when we capture that fingerprint, it's a secure link into, 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 that, in, into that secure enclave or that piece of hardware, and it's not going to leave there. So from a privacy point of view, it's good because my biometric data doesn't get off that phone. And even, allegedly, the FBI have problems in, in extracting biometric data from Apple iPhones. So, IoT, Internet of Things, um, billions of connected things out there. Um, you know, we mentioned, you know, I, I referenced the, um, the Alexa Echo, um, the smart device there. The, um, um, think of the Echo, I had a chat with one of the, uh, a guy who supplies the voice technology for um, the Echo. And think of the Echo as a robot without legs. So this is Amazon's, this is all this is, the first kind of device in the house that we can, we can talk to. So think of it kind of having a face, think of it then growing some sort of mobility, and we want to, and the thing is, it's not us identifying ourselves to these devices, it's them wanting to know who we are as well. So we'll get that kind of capability, that kind of two-way relationship as we, as I kind of recognize Steve over there, um, you know, it, it's, it's that two-way interaction. Um, that we'll see it. So we're seeing you know, biometrics into connected cars this year. Uh, we'll see a lot of high-end luxury cars. They'll either have IRS or facial recognition going into, in, in, into their vehicles for um, personalization, for payments, for health, wellness, and well-being. And also smart city devices. So it's another area where passwords are pretty poor, and we need a way of identifying ourselves or for things to verify us as well. So, smart cards, um, this has got a, a fingerprint sensor in it. There's pilots on at the moment, uh, the Bank of Cyprus have uh, partnered with, um, I think it's uh, Jamalto, um, the, the card manufacturer. And the, these are contactless cards, they take the power from the point, point of sale device, they're used for payments, so we power it up. We put our fingerprint on it, and then it authenticates. And because of contactless car usage is rocketing, you know, UK is, 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 is way ahead of other regions in terms of its acceptance of contactless, because it's really convenient. The problem is we've got a 30 pound limit on there. We've got a 30 euro limit in, in Western Europe. With this, we can remove that limit. So we could be using contactless all the time. Great for the retailer, because it reduces that friction and means we spend more. 
Um, the issue is obviously that's going to cost a little bit more money, um, around about $20 versus a dollar for a normal EMV card. But apparently, um, people in the know think this is, this is coming, and we'll be, we'll be seeing um, larger deployments at the back end of this year and into next year. Again, replacing the pin. Something that we've got to remember, something that's inconvenient. ATMs, um, this is a uh, finger vein, I think. ATM um, down in um, Brazil. Um, Brazil, they've got about 80% of their ATMs are biometrically enabled. So you can be on Copacabana Beach in your Speedos and you can rock up to the ATM and you can just use your finger or your vein and you can get your, your money out. So, and mainly for fraud, because they've got such high levels of, of, of card fraud, skimming down there, um, people, and quite violent stuff goes on in terms of getting, extracting your pin. Um, you know, we work for, uh, with a couple of suppliers down, down in Brazil, and, you know, seeing them firsthand, the problem they're seeing in terms of physical security and pin, um, you know, extraction um, at, at the ATM. So they just chop your finger off instead. So progress, eh? Um, so Japan, very high. We're seeing finger vein, palm vein, face in China with facial recognition in there. It means you can replace the card and replace the pin. So you know, millions of transactions per day are using this technology. Obviously related to where we think cash is in terms of its, its um, decline or... Um, point of sale devices, this is a UK company who's using a, a Hitachi device. This is Fingervein, this is Fingo Pay, and they've deployed, you know, perhaps we could get it um, deployed in here because it, it, it's, it's cardless um, cash or cardless payment at the point of sale. It's been deployed in the University of Brunel. And it, um, it uses tokenization as well. So you kind of register your card, a bit like Apple Pay. You register your card, that gets stored um, securely in a, in a tokenized model. And then you're, 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 you're in a way, you're in the index, you're indexing your, your biometric to the, the tokenized version of your card, and that then authorizes the payment. So again, cashless. And we see a lot, that's very good in um, things like events. In, we're getting seen in pubs because you don't have to use your, you bring out your card all the time. Um, you just have to register once. And the company's called Fingo Pay. Um, okay, so um, another area where we're seeing a lot of technology um, interest and growth is the use of um, um, AI and machine learning, either in chip or cloud based solutions. So Apple's A11 chip in the, the latest 10, um, you know, supports machine learning, its neural capabilities, and that enhance, enhances. So it's learning about us. So if we, if I grow a beard or something, or if I, um, you know, change my hairstyle or something, wear sunglasses, it can actually learn. You know, chucking large amounts of data at it to to to, to enhance its accuracy and performance. And we're also seeing you know, leveraging the power of the cloud for AI and ML um, enhances the performance of biometrics. Um, and, in, and obviously, we may, you may have seen the stories about China and in, in what they're doing in building up a, a facial recognition solution, using it for, and they've got these glasses. Have you seen, have you seen the glasses that the, the police guys are using? So this is all linked up to their facial bi biometric database, which uses ML, supplied by a company called Face++. It's used in Alipay's solution as well. And we're using, and there's also Google, um, Facebook, um, offer, Amazon offer, offer an API um, for this. So it's, it's verging on the creepy, I must admit. But it does, you know, one of the problems about, about you know, facial is, is, is accuracy, liveness detection. So it can enhance, enhance the performance of, of facial recognition. Um, and also leveraging the cloud. So instead of having my fingerprint template stored on a phone, we'll get it stored up in the cloud. It means I can use, you know, interact with my services, services um, from a, um, a variety of, of devices. There is the security and privacy um, issues with that, which I'll come to in a minute. So barriers, what are the problems around biometrics? Lack of standardization. Um, 
apart from border control, law enforcement, we don't have a lot of standards relating to authentication and identity. Very proprietary, very early days. As I said, we do have you know, the, the FIDO standards, the FIDO protocols. They're getting starting to roll out, um, and they do support biometrics um, on a device, so their device-based authentication model. Privacy, especially in the GDPR era, you know, it, it is the collection and storage of such personal information is, 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 is you know, to get that right, to get the security of that right, is paramount. And we have had some issues with centrally stored biometric databases. The Office of Personal Management, the OPM, were hacked three years ago, I think, in the US. Um, and that was a large fingerprint database of, of US personnel. That was probably a state-sponsored attack, um, getting those fingerprints because they wanted to know agents coming into various countries. So when they're collecting the, uh, the biometrics on entry, then they could probably match it to what the OPM database was doing. So that's the theory. Also with uh, India, with the Universal Identity Program, the largest biometric kind of um, solution or a program in the world, there have been problems with leakage, um, there's been some process issues surrounding um, you know, fraudulent misuse of, of, of biometric data. So if you're going to store it in a central, you know, we're talking about the passwords, you know, storing passwords is a problem, you know, it is, I have to be convinced personally, to be convinced about the, um, the sensible, or sensibility of, of storing such private data in a central database. Okay, and surrounding the GDP also with the explicit consent for use of biometric data. So if I'm going to be using a biometric or a service provider wants to collect my biometric, GDPR, we've got to give explicit consent that that, that is allowed to be used. So with a fraud perspective, if I'm using, it, if I'm using a telephone banking or something and they're analysing my voice print for fraud, which is a passive biometric, um, then GDP does not apply to that. So, or data protection law doesn't apply to that. Because with fraud management, I think it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's outside of that. Spoof attacks, live detections, we've probably all seen, you know, attacking you know, some of the cheaper fingerprint sensors on mobile phones with a gummy bear or with wood glue, or you know, capturing a fingerprint and then creating a composite. It's possible, but it's not a scalable attack. Because, you know, and it takes, it takes a, a lot of, you know, it, it does take, a, I've done it myself, it takes a lot of, of trial and error in getting it right. And if we're talking about the business of fraud, the business of being a criminal, then, you know, it, it's, it's, if, I'm, if, I can, if I can attack a database, if I can, you know, uh, commit a large scale um, attack on, uh, on a central depository of biometric or personal data, then I'm going to do that. I'm not going to attack everybody's phone. So that is a targeted attack. That's going for a high value asset if I'm going to be attempting to use that. And if I'm a high value asset, I'm not really going to be using Apple's Touch ID to authenticate for any, any, any particular um, um, usage there. And live detection, this is the, you know, the thing if a cut someone's finger off, then it won't, won't, be, won't, use, it won't, won't be allowed to be used because um, you know, it, it, it's detecting for, for, for a live finger. And we can do that with, uh, we're seeing a, a new range of optical sensors, optical fingerprint sensors going mobile. And with optical, we can actually look at the capillaries, we can look underneath the skin. So we have a better, far understand, better understanding that is actually connected to, to a body. And, 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 it's, and also with facial recognition, which has been pretty poor, at, um, at live detection, you know, I can um, print off a, a picture, or I can use an iPad of someone's um, face, and then with older, older solutions that don't have good live detection, I'll be able to spoof it quite easily. Um, so that needs to improve, and it is improving. Um, and consumer acceptance and the creepy factor. I think we've gone beyond that in terms of use of device-based biometrics, fingerprinting, um, but I think it's more the, the surveillance aspects of this, um, we, we, which do have um, you know, substantial, significant um, civil liberties and privacy issues. So they're barriers. So just to summarize, um, so the move to mobile and up and things, um, you know, it resulted in traditional authentication systems being irrelevant, not irrelevant, but, but, but difficult to use. The drive is convenience, 
Improved user experience um, is driving de um, deployment. Interesting, so we work with a lot of authentication companies and they're seeing, so when they sell their solutions, they're not selling it to the security team anymore or the IT team, they're selling it into digital transformation teams for user experience and then they're getting the, the tick in the box from security and risk. So it's a different buyer and those different buyers are looking at you know, you know, user interaction, they're looking at, um, um, you know, they're, they're net promoter score, looking at all those marketing measurements rather than, you know, is it secure, is it, will it, will it uh, um, you know, stand up to a man in the middle attack, etc. We're seeing, you know, significant mi billions of devices, millions of users adopt this. Um, passwords are convenient, and in the age of the, the mega breach, um, you know, there is a significant drive from the industry to, to, to replace them with something else. Um, you know, pass, but passwords are part of the solution you know, and, and, and shouldn't be used, relied upon um, as a single factor. Um, they should be used with other you know, device fingerprinting, risk-based authentication, you know, geolocation, etc. So if we use them, if we, you know, as, as, a, as, the, as the, perhaps the entry point so to make it convenient for users to authorize transactions to prove their identity, then, then that, that's a win-win. And as with most death, death of stories, passwords not, will not die. Now, I used to work for Delarue. Delarue's main business is printing banknotes. And so 45% of people in the UK last year used cash for payments. And OK, there's a, there's a curve down, but they're still going to be used. I still use paper books. And passwords and um, pins will still be used, I think, for, for a significant amount of time. So that's the end of, of my formal presentation. Thank you.